uh, getting closer. Uh, my name my name is Andrew. I, I publish as A.K. Thompson, and this is a Uh, this is a, a workshop that I first gave with a few other people at Left Forum uh, this past March, and I was really happy to be invited to this conference to do it again. Um, a little bit about myself. I've been a political organizer, in, mostly in Toronto, uh, for a long time. I've been uh, active on the radical left for about 20 years, and uh, I became really, really active in political discussions in Toronto, starting around uh, anti-globalization struggles, kind of Seattle era. And uh, that's when I began really, really thinking through what it meant to be a radical other than just going to demonstrations and so on. So uh, more recently, this has become uh, manifest in like, a desire to like, really, really look at the categories that we use to describe our political struggles and really figure out, like, what are we talking about when we say X? Right? So one of the projects that I've been working on with a few people uh, in, <clears throat> in my sort of political life after having been an editor with the journal Upping the Ante, a journal of theory and action for about five years, is specifically a discussion about you know, what are these words that we use and what do they mean. So I'm working on a project right now called Keywords for Radicals. And one of the entries in that is going to be a discussion of community. <clears throat> More generally, I think that the anti-globalization era really raised the question of community organizing for the, this generation of radicals and kind of set a framework for debate primarily through uh, the discussion about uh, summit hopping versus local organizing, if, if people remember that. Um, and that was really the, the means by which the idea of community was reintroduced into uh, radical political discussion. And at this point, I think most people would agree that community has now become an almost commonsensical word for, uh, for radical politics, that we talk about community all the time as though it were kind of a self-evident thing, that we all know what we mean. And we might dispute kind of what it should look like or what, where its boundaries are. But if I say community, in all likelihood, you'll um, you'll know what I mean and you'll know how to respond and we can have a conversation about it But it's in some ways. It's like a uh, what uh, Linguistic theorists would call a floating signifier right that like all kinds of people use the word community including capitalists so the in order to proceed with their agendas so the distinctions that we make between say uh, you know, being anti-capitalist and pro-community sometimes don't make sense because capitalists themselves are often pro-community, although not necessarily in the way that we would think through. So this, um, this presentation is an attempt to look at how the concept of community gets used in radical organizing today, investigate a little bit where that comes from, and point to some of the critiques of community as an organizing category, and it, um, there are many critiques of it, but I want to emphasize today critiques that arise specifically within the writing of anti-racist feminist organizers and theorists, because very often community gets posited as a category that's explicitly associated with anti-racist organizing or anti-oppression organizing practices. So I think it's significant that some of its most vocal detractors have in fact been uh, theorists working within those traditions. Because it's been the kind of day it's been, it's been I'm going to drink water a bunch. I think uh, still dehydrated from last night. So. <laughs> my, my idea for this was just that I was, I was going to talk for maybe like 25 minutes or so, and then we can open it up for a discussion. I know probably a lot of you have experience either encountering community as a political concept or, alter, or alternately working with it explicitly as a political concept. Um, and so I'm very interested in seeing uh, if some of the challenges that, uh, that I identify resonate with you or alternately um, how in having confronted them perhaps in your own organizing you've managed to address these issues or overcome them. So a lot of what I'm going to be presenting 
today is um, is also drawn from chapter three of my book Black Block White Riot, which came out in 2010 with AK Press, and specifically chapter three, which is called Bringing the War Home. And I'm gonna time myself just to make sure I stay honest and stay stay to my allocated time. Can can you just can you shout at me when it gets to around like like fifteen minutes or sure. twenty minutes? And I think the screen is gonna go blank. Yeah. So I was just about to keep okay. Great. That took you all fifteen seconds. Oh, I thought that was minutes. <laughs> I know it's, it's over. Uh, <clears throat> all right. So as I said, the the concept of community as we use it now as this kind of self-evident political category, I think really can be traced back to the discussions at the beginning of the 21st century within anti-globalization struggles that emerged out of this fight between po the political strategies that were referred to as summit hopping and local organizing. And whereas summit hopping was perceived as being transient, deracinated, and exhausting, uh, with the effect that people couldn't really sink roots anywhere. Local organizing was perceived as being a way of uh, building bases and dealing with uh, the injustices of neoliberal uh, capitalism, the new enclosures and so on, at the level where the problems were actually happening. And the way that that uh, space got articulated primarily, the way that the local got envisioned in positive terms was as the community. The community became the base unit. A political organizing. It's significant though that this, this uh, characterization of the base for political struggle has much deeper roots and I'm going to talk about uh, that a little bit in my presentation but one of the places where we can see it happening really directly is within the new left where uh, within organizations like Students for a Democratic Society there was definitely uh, a tension between those who were committed to like national mobilizations and those who were committed to base building work and started doing summer schools around like anti-poverty work and voter registration and that kind of stuff. Um, but whatever its origins, I think it's clear that today activists in North America identify with community both as a site of struggle and also as a strategy of struggle. So it's both uh, a container, a, a space within which struggle happens, and, and also a means of struggling. <clears throat> As a site of struggle, community is considered important because it denotes a scale on which the problems that arise within capitalism can be both immediately experienced and also immediately challenged. Uh, as a strategy, I think community is considered important because it carries within it the kind of promise of a revitalized human connection in a period marked by capitalism's extreme social fragmentation. So in a context where someone like John Zerzan can point out that in the 1990s, most Americans had three significant relationships in their life, and by the end of the, of the century, they had two. Uh, in that kind of moment, the idea of community was uh, seen as really important because it becomes the space for revitalized social connections. In both of these versions, community as a site of struggle and community as a strategy of struggle, uh, one of the things that seems to be uh, prevalent is that as radicals we tend to perceive community as though it were a self-evident good. Um, <clears throat> even in instances where we acknowledge that community as we currently envision it uh, doesn't yet correspond to its radical potential. That's like an idea that doesn't live up to its promise. We nevertheless try to fix our communities so that they might li live up to our idealized assumptions about them. Only seldom do we call the concept of community itself into question, and that's what I'm hoping that we can do in this, sec in this session. As a result of this incapacity, I think, we've often had a hard time developing concepts that might better enable us to produce the conditions that we presently associate uh, with communities' promise. So it becomes an impediment to thinking through the things we're actually trying to address with the concept. Uh, this unwillingness to call the self-evident goodness of community into question is somewhat strange, I think, uh, uh, since even though community gets advanced, as I mentioned, as a kind of anti-oppressive principle or as an anti-racist principle, it's often been anti-racist feminist scholars, theorists, and organizers who've been most critical of the concept. In my own work, I've been especially uh, 
taken by the critiques of community advanced by writers like Hamani Banerjee, who was my, uh, who was my supervisor and longtime comrade in Toronto, uh, Miranda Joseph, who's located on the West Coast, uh, and Michelle Wallace, uh, who's uh, New York-based. Uh, in what follows, I'm going to give a brief overview of some of these critiques and trace a brief history of community as an activist concept in 15 minutes, 10 minutes. You can watch your phone, my friend. <laughs> uh, so, that's what I said. So I have all the time in the world. Oh, uh, okay. so, so of the three writers I mentioned, Michelle Wallace was uh, the first to advance an anti-racist feminist critique of community. And most of you will know her from a book that came out in 1979 called Black Macho and the Myth of the Superwoman. Um, I'm only going to give very sketchy overviews of the arguments in, in any of these texts, but I, 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 think, I think they're really important reference points for our current discussion. Uh, so in that book, Wallace pointed out how black women's oppression actually increased as a result of black power politics when those politics turned to uh, forms of cultural nationalism uh, as the movement developed. Uh, and the, the principal form that that took was commu uh, black community control, which often meant uh, uh, black entrepreneurial capitalist uh, control of um, of neighborhoods through businesses, but also through uh, forms of cultural dominance. Uh, and she says that in this context, uh, white establishment concessions to black male control over the com community uh, was actually a political strategy on the part of white America to divert uh, uh, black power struggles away from uh, more significant struggles for uh, social and economic justice uh, toward forms of cultural recognition and that the community became sort of the, the leverage, the, the means by which this was enabled. We'll give you your communities back, uh, but then you become basically like, uh, like our client state within them, that you, you perpetuate a version of black capitalism within those communities uh, under the name of cultural, cultural nationalism. Uh, noting a similar dynamic, a Canadian-based anti-racist feminist, Mani Banerjee, points out in Dark Side of the Nation, Jessica Lewis just gave me back my copy, which is nice if you want to have a look at it afterwards. It's a great book. Um, <clears throat> how far from being a kind of natural category um, of association, like something that emerges autonomously from the way that we live our lives, that community is actually a category of ruling. That is, that a community at a particular historical moment gets taken up by the state as a particular category of ruling. And this is especially the case in Canada, where uh, there's a policy of official multiculturalism. So the idea is uh, develop uh, state apparatus to recognize communities, and in the process, both produce them and induct them into forms of state management. So uh, you become the community that has recognizable leaders, both formal and informal. And this becomes the, uh, this becomes the way in Canada of managing racialized others. <clears throat> so here, the state policy of official multiculturalism becomes the basis upon which minority populations could be organized into clearly defined and governable groups with, bo with both official and unofficial representatives. According to Banerjee, one of the practical effects of this arrangement was that rather than serving to illuminate dynamics of oppression, uh, community actually made those dynamics harder to see. Um, and she defines community as an ideological category. <clears throat> uh, in her book, Against the Romance of Community, which is a little more recent, Miranda Joseph points out how these dynamics play out uh, in the context of queer organizing in San Francisco, where the concept of the gay community has actively been used to paper over real differences in the experiences and interests of uh, the people that it claims to, the community claims to represent. Um, but rather, she says, than uh, abandoning the concept of community um, as an organizing principle, Joseph points out how the reaction of those who were fighting within this terrain uh, was <clears throat> um, for people who were included within the overall concept of community, but also marginalized within it, uh, to, con to constitute separate communities on newer, purer, but most often on smaller grounds. So the community subdivides, and rather than talking about the queer community, we end up talking about uh, like either the radical queer community or uh, 
you know, the uh, people of color, queer community, and so on. So she points out in empirical detail how that process shook down in San Francisco. <clears throat> uh, so not only does the strategy have consequences in terms of diminishing people's capacity to develop clear political alliances, uh, because they're fettered from the beginning with the presumption that there should be unity. Um, but it also makes, uh, 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 she also makes clear how community in that case was a concept or a category that was actively being used by the state, by San Francisco, uh, to do social regulation through things like arts council funding. So arts council funding was directed toward uh, communities so that they could be represented and so on. Um, but if, if these are some of uh, the limitations to community that have been pointed out by uh, anti-racist and feminist theorists, um, I think that we still have to figure out, you know, why is it that this concept right now is so resonant for activists? Like, like why, do we, why do we love it as much as uh, we seem to do? I think in order to answer this question, it's necessary to look at the historical origins of community as a political conception. Uh, and <clears throat> I want to propose further, um, we need to look specifically at the role that community plays as a kind of um, symptom of um, race formation within the modern world system, uh, and in particular, the, how the experience of whiteness get shaped with the, de with the development of capitalism uh, starting in the 18th century. Um, that in some ways commu community becomes uh, a symptom of uh, the, the contradictory experiences of whiteness. Um, and I'm focusing on whiteness here because of the, uh, the dominance of community within prim primarily white North American radical organizations as a, as a focus. Um, <clears throat> and in, a, in addition to being uh, a symptom of those contradictions, how it also plays the role uh, as a kind of compensation, as a, a, a partial attempt to resolve the, the lack that arises from the incapacity to resolve these contradictions. So if we, if we look back to uh, the development of capitalism in, uh, in Europe, uh, and particularly the moment of industrialization in the early middle 19th century, we can, we can see really, really immediately the rise of a rebellion against uh, capitalist ascent, industrialization, and the forms of calculative rationality or instrumental rationality that happened to it. And this is mostly known as romanticism, this idea um, that uh, you, know, you could challenge uh, capitalism's uh, pulling apart of previous forms of social ties and reorganization of social relations by revitalizing an interest with and an identification with what were perceived to be earlier forms of social life. Uh, so uh, in particular, in places like Germany, France, and England, this led to a romanticization uh, and identification with forms of pastoral life uh, and to identification with the mythic promise that people associated with historically and geographically uh, remote places that were considered to somehow be untarnished uh, by industrial capitalism and its uh, attendant forms of instrumental rationality. So you can think of things like in England, you have the emergence of uh, rom groups of romantic poets like the Lake Poets, amongst whom there's William Wordsworth, who's like, you know, I'm, I, don't, I don't want this city shit. I'm going back to the country, and I'm gonna, I, I don't want instrumental rationality. I don't want my life cut up and partitioned that way. So I can say things like, in the tables turned, I'll say, enough of science and of art. Uh, close up those barren leaves, come forth, and bring with thee a heart that watches and receives. So it's like this attempt to find a new basis for thinking and relating to the world that's at odds with capitalism. But at the same time, that's perceived to be more in connection with forms of natural association, forms of natural bonds uh, that people were previously held or thought to have. Now as to whether or not those bonds ever actually existed in precisely the manner that people thought they did uh, is an open question, right? Because a lot of this was a, a celebration of peasant life, and of course, 
you know, peasant life wasn't awesome. It wasn't like it, you know. Uh, so there's a there's a romanticization of prior forms of association, and I want to say that the, um, you can you can anticipate how this might find contemporary echoes. Um, <clears throat> Now, uh, in ch the way that it played out, for instance, uh, at the time of the New Left, you know, this, this identification with the promise of some other moment or some other people who really had their shit together, who really knew how to live together and do things, um, was pointed out by Stokely Carmichael and Charles Hamilton in Black Power uh, when they were talking about SNCC organizing in the South in, in the 1960s and things like voter registration campaigns and so on. Um, and uh, uh, Carmichael writes about white kids who were doing this. Um, he says uh, that for many white radicals, like some sort of Pepsi, this is his quote, he says, like some sort of Pepsi generation, they wanted to come alive through black communities and black groups. They've wanted to be where the action is, and the action has been in these places. They have sought refuge among, amongst blacks from a sterile, meaningless, irrelevant life in middle class. America. So here you see that uh, the the identification with the community here, the black community, but also with the idea of community itself as such as a form of cultural association becomes a kind of compensation for an experience of black that arises directly out of the successes of capitalism that correspond to the development of uh, white privilege and also the fragmentation of white consciousness. Um, and there are other examples that we can look to as well. Now, it's significant that although romanticism as a kind of political tendency that emerged alongside capitalism was for the most part anti-capitalist, it was like, fuck this shit, you know, this is, uh, it's uh, important to recognize that at the same time it was also reactionary, that it's anti-capitalism wasn't about completing capitalism, like resolving the contradictions within capital capitalism and trying to produce something new. It was about uh, conceptually negating capitalism, like saying, okay, we're not gonna do this, we're gonna do this instead. And the, and the vision of what the, the opposite of capitalism was, was some moment prior to it. So romanticism was always a, an attempt to return to a past, to return to a moment where somehow <laughs> this came together. Um, and while there are, I, I think, a number of significant political debates that could be had about uh, the, the character and the attributes of romanticism, uh, many social theorists concur that as a movement it tended over time to lean rightward. So even though romanticism was radical uh, at its inception and its anti-capitalism, over time it moved rightward as a movement. Uh, and in the most extreme version of this dynamic, we can see how in Germany, the 19th century romantic identification with what it called Vogue, so that people that existed prior to the fragmentation of capitalism that we might associate very directly with our concept of community, led almost imperceptibly into the 20th century uh, uh, kind of sensibilities of fascist politics. Um, but more generally, the romantic love of community has been tied to uh, conservative critiques of modernity and the Enlightenment tradition. So even if it doesn't go as far as uh, as fascism, but it still uh, <clears throat> it still finds expression in uh, uh, you know the the fetish of pastoral life that you know that can still see, be seen in uh, American politics today. Uh, Michael Pollan's the the locavore movement, for instance, being described as being like one of the most conservative movements there is, and so on. Um, and so, while the the socialist left, like the um, the kind of precursors to our own radicalism in the early nineteenth century, was also marked by romantic sensibilities at some time. And here we can think of the work of people like uh, Charles uh, Charles Fourier in France, uh, who wrote uh, kind of utopian socialist things about like uh, new ways of living in community and sort of set up kind of templates like for these utopian communes uh, where everything would be perfect and chickens would fall from the sky like <laughs> all, like pre-fried. <laughs> um, despite this kind of stuff, um, the, 
uh, the revolutionary socialist tradition came over time to be much more identified with this idea that the, the way to have a revolution against capitalism was to complete capitalism. So expropriate all its shit and transform it so that it could happen on new basis. That there were things already within capitalism that we could steal and make better and that would be the basis for revolution that we didn't have to return to some prior moment. Uh, but it's significant that in, especially in North America, the period of around the 1960s began to see a kind of radical retraction of that sensibility within revolutionary politics. So the, the idea that, uh, that the revolution was the completion of the, the universalist aspirations of the Enlightenment tradition, or that uh, the revolutionary politics was like, you know, the bourgeoisie said liberty, equality, fraternity, but couldn't pull it off. We mean it and we know how to put it into practice. Instead, uh, at that moment, people started uh, reverting to forms of romantic thinking uh, in radical politics. Uh, and you can see this, especially in uh, the, the work of new left writers, starting with Herbert Marcuse, uh, who reintroduced kind of romantic ideas, the critique of uh, one-dimensional society and so on, ends up really echoing the 19th century critique of calculative rationality. And then in uh, movement documents like the Port Huron Statement, which uh, picks up these kind of ideas and says, you know, we can't live in this atomized, fragmented way, and we're going to try to revitalize community through participatory democracy, through finding ways of really listening to each other, through healing the psychosis of like uh, racist divisions in our society, and so on. And it's really at this moment that uh, the, the kind of precursors to um, a love of community begin to emerge. But there's a kind of, there's a kind of schizophrenia that goes along with it. And uh, Martin Duberman points this out in a, an article in Partisan Review in the 1960s, where he's talking about how uh, white new left activists related to uh, the early black power movement and to um, uh, organizing amongst poor people in, uh, in urban ghettos. He says uh, of, of the white activists uh, and their kind of strange, like, uh, in contradictory relationship to, to communities, which were always seen to be like the attribute of someone else, right? Like poor black people have communities, but white people are like socially fragmented and they have to go and find the community. Um, and Duberman says, it's this lumpen proletariat, so like the people of the, the ghetto, long kept outside the system and thus uncorrupted by its values, who are looked to as the repository of virtue, an example of a better way. The new left, even while deme demanding that the lot of the underclass be improved, implicit implicitly venerates that lot. The desire to cure poverty cohabits with the wish to emulate it. And so we can see this in contemporary movements, that this kind of uh, uh, like white middle class kids dropping out, uh, uh, embracing slumming, and so on, uh, moving to, moving to uh, neighborhoods ostensibly for cheap rent, but then also like really, really identifying culturally with, you know, with the real kind of human connections that emerge in that place. And this is a dynamic that comes up, especially in a lot of kind of early work within uh, the kind of crime think canon. So um, <clears throat> we can talk about that maybe in the discussion. Um, now, I think this new identification, this turn back to the community as a, as a social space, starting in the 1960s and then in our own period, kind of from 99 to Occupy, uh, is useful in as much as it's forced us to think about what kind of scale of interactions um, we, need to, we need to consider um, when, to, when thinking through how to have immediate effects, how our actions can be consequential, um, <clears throat> and also uh, to really address the question of affective ties, right? Like, I don't, you know, I don't think that the way to deal with capitalist alienation is to just say, well, this is a symptom of a more general problem, and the more unbearable it becomes for me, the more I'll fight to have revolution, so then I can finally feel things. Like, obviously, we still have to live in this world. 
However, I think the emphasis on community in our current discussions has also meant that we're more likely to cede the terrain that we call the global uh, to those who remain fully capable of operating on this scale. So, you know, there was a real there was a real move away, I think, for a long time um, of doing anything other than community organizing or local based organizing, um, and just like not not challenging, you know, international trade agreements or other things, which are really um, you know, forces that are determining what, what is happening at the local level. So we, we kind of became a culture of ambulance chasers in the hope that somehow like the blood of others would like rub off on us and, and we'd say, okay, well I was really there because it's, it's much more concrete than dealing, dealing with things at the abstract level that used to get called uh, summit hopping. Some of the contradictions though that arise with this is that even though this was put forward as an ostensibly anti-racist position by mostly white radicals is that it had the effect of cutting, uh, cutting out from view all of these anti-racist struggles that were happening at an international level, at the level of the global. So uh, Leslie Wood, who was a key organizer with the Toronto Community Mobilization Network, the group that did a community-based organizing model for uh, demonstrations against the G20 when it took place in uh, Toronto in 2010 um, pointed out uh, how in trying to do this uh, in trying to do this organizing model where they were going to say okay local organizing against the G20 and we're going to do uh, local versus global community versus summit hopping or whatever that in, in kind of telling the story this way and trying to actively posit the community as being against uh, this sort of summit hopping model uh, they, they, ha they produced a situation where there was no way to account for all of this really important international, anti-racist international solidarity work, particularly like Palestine solidarity work and other kinds of work uh, that, that were happening in Toronto, but that didn't really fit into the story uh, that, the, that the Toronto Community Mobilization Network told about itself, about what community organizing was. Um, and I think at the same time that like these strategic problems have arisen around framing, um, the, the, the kind of activist fetish of community has also almost completely ignored the fact that capitalism itself has really, really actively mobilized the concept of community to deal with its own uh, problems. So it's not like capitalism isn't aware of the alienation and fragmentation that it causes. So it, it posits community as like the, uh, as the way to try to like, uh, produce a new scale where people can imagine that consumption is happening in a way that brings people together, you know, or, or you know, or we'll talk about uh, dehumanizing impersonal relationships like banking, for instance, in terms of community. So I, I would encourage you all uh, when, uh, when you leave this conference and maybe go back to uh, other cities to just look at how much advertising uh, done by capitalists actively embraces and mobilizes this language of community, um, and we can say that like this is this is cynical, right? Like, but uh, at the same time, we have to recognize that the motivation for capital to do that is actually identical to the motivation that activists um, have done it. Particularly white white middle class radicals who have tried to you know deal with their own sort of contradictory experiences within uh, capitalism. I want to conclude by saying that none of this means that communities are therefore false uh, or politically irredeemable. However, I think it does mean that in order to relate to community in politically and strategically useful ways, we need to take all of these contradictory dimensions into consideration when developing our practices. So I'm going to leave it there, and I hope that we still have time to talk. Can I just, I talk. We started 15 minutes late, so we still have 20 minutes. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.
especially in terms of like political um, movements or organizing it in that way because people, or does that make sense? Do you know what I mean? So I guess any perspective you have on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there are a few things maybe that come up in your, um, um, in your comments. The first is that um, capitalism has like some general tendencies, right? Like so we can observe a tendency toward financialization or we can observe a tendency toward um, changes in center periphery relationships where you know industrial production is happening no longer in, in North America and the economy here changes and you know and China and India and Bangladesh becomes sites of industrial production. So those we can see those kind of general tendencies. But even within particular spaces like the United States, the the speed at which capitalism transforms uh, is different for uh, for different people, right? The way that people get plugged into the logic of production is uneven. It's uh, an expression of what David Harvey describes as uneven development, right? So th this um, this means, I think, that the the relationship to concepts like family and home and land uh, are also differential, right? So in cosmopolitan cities in the global north, in places like New York and Toronto and so on, the, the base unit of production consumption for large sections of the white working class is no longer the family and starts becoming the individual, right? So in contexts like that, the relationship to uh, relationship to time, relationship to family, relationship to space, all of these things change in an objective sense and they have corresponding transformations that take place conceptually and like at the level of experience, right? And as a result of that, I think that there are sometimes like real jarring contrasts that happen, even within a single city space, around how people relate to these concepts. So for, for people who are kind of expelled from this 20th century industrial model of production consumption that's organized around a nine to five work day and the family and the home and things like that, uh, the idea of community has like a very different kind of seduction than it does for people who are still uh, like within those cities, but have uh, continue to have a relationship to industrial production through things like uh, uh, light manufacturing, mm -hmm. for instance, where where the workday is still uh, still retains features that it had in the twentieth century, where the family rather than the individual is sort of the necessary unit for the reproduction of labor power. And for those people, community is, uh, is a much more practical thing, right? Like you, you know the, the people on your block, not because you have affective ties with them, but probably because they're catching the clock at the same, mm -hmm. same damn place as you, right? So in that sense, yeah, it's less romantic and it has a, a kind of like a practical base building yeah. character to it, right? And I think that um, this kind of differential pull, right? And that these dynamics are also very racial. Right? Mm -hmm. So uh, it's much more likely in you know in the American context, at least for uh, for people of color who grew up here, who aren't sort of first or first or second generation immigrants, who might be in this weird precarious but professionalized mm -hmm. sphere where their like their experiences are much more velocitized than they are for uh, you know for uh, communities of color that have been here for a really long time and are kind of rooted in neighborhoods. You know, this just means that the relationships to the idea of community and what it means either as like a practical thing about like base building versus mm -hmm. the idea that this is somehow like the the thing that's going to save me from my stupid white life are very different. Right. And, I, and I think that I think that the tr the challenge is to figure out a way of uh, translating those two registers and recognizing that they're actually both symptomatic of dynamics implicit within the development of capitalism. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. I was wondering if you had any perspective on how kind of communities have developed around Occupy fractured or came together or what have you, because there was always some kind of drama with that because it was people kind of like imposing, not necessarily, imposing the idea of community upon themselves as a re revolutionary action in kind of a, mm -hmm. a different space, but then like the, I don't know, I just saw over and over again the kind of theoretical practice of that coming to blows pretty seriously with like the actual practice of that. Yeah. And I was wondering if you had any like perspective or 
I, I think Occupy is fascinating, and I think that this is one of the places where um, the, the question of community takes on what might be its fullest political significance, right? So Occupy was always contradictory. It always played in this indeterminate zone between like a politics of demand, mm -hmm. you know, and trying to operate within like rights-based politics where individual subjects would be recognized by the state. And it's like, mm -hmm. yes, you have your right to free speech. You have, yes, you have your right to public space. And then this other thing, which was about like, we are constituting a new political subject within this space, and it's like basically going to be like civil war. It's going to be a contest of sovereignties. It's like, mm -hmm. we are Occupy Wall Street, or we are Occupy Toronto, or whatever, and mm -hmm. like we're covering at this space, and we're setting up a new way of living, in you know, mm -hmm. and and we defy you, the surrounding nation, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to to shut us down, right? And so in that in that sense, it was like attempts to set up a new republic in some mm -hmm. ways. Now the the problem is that the the political ambition to do that, which I think is the correct one and satisfies the most basic determinations of what politics is, you know. Politics is about, you know, who's gonna, who's gonna say who we are, mm -hmm. uh, what the space is in which that we is gonna operate, and what kind of social relations are gonna obtain within that space, right? Mm -hmm. And that, like, uh, in doing that, we set up a kind of form of life, and that form of life, if need be, goes to war with other forms of life that would try to Try to shut it down, right? So politics is always about sovereignty. It's always it always has war as its uh, as its kind of ultimate principle, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like us versus them, and so on. So in Occupy, some of those attributes come to come to be really present, right? You get uh, we we know who we are, we know who uh, we know the the scope of our area. It's like we're taking this park. It's like the form of life stuff where that like that was where the mythology kicks back in, right? Like we, you know, we imagine ourselves as a utopian community that can somehow just sort all this stuff out, even though it's like college kids and homeless people and you know people who have never talked together, people whose interests are objectively not immediately reconcilable, mm -hmm. trying to sort it out in that space. And the idea of community in that moment becomes an impediment to sorting it out. Because the presumption of a we was the starting point rather than the political outcome. Mm -hmm. And this can be useful politically in the short term as a kind of like hegemonic bracket, right? Mm -hmm. We say we as a way of uh, resolving uh, or bracketing contradictions uh, that we have to resolve amongst ourselves so that we can do action. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it won't last forever, right? And eventually those things come up. And obviously in so many camps they did. Yeah. And uh, and people can probably describe concrete examples of that. But obviously, uh, practical, like the most immediate and practical and, and often frightening examples of it, where things are not safety. Mm -hmm. I, want, I wanted to say something about the, the arrival of the, of the current legislation of community but I'm now realizing that it actually comes into the Occupy stuff in a way that I want to kind of disagree with you in some ways. Um, I like disagreement. So some of my best friends are disagreeable. <laughs> <laughs> but so it seems like one of the, the pieces of, of your account of, of community um, that isn't so visible in the description is is the Alinsky community organizing as a very specific ideology of community as something that's, that's inherent, supernaturalized, highly bordered, and based on a notion that there is, that what community means is an inherent unity of interest and a sort of, yeah. Um, unity of interest and unity of opinion mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. um, which I think is absolutely ass backwards for all kinds of reasons um, as an organizing model, but also I think Occupy points to how bad a way of thinking about community it is. Mm -hmm. um, 
which in ways that I think reflect everyone's experience of, of what actual community relationships are like, which are much more about contention and argument and having to keep dealing with your neighbors even though they keep throwing trash in your backyard mm -hmm. and or having bitter knockdown drag out um, mm -hmm. arguments at the dinner table in your synagogue, in your political organization, whatever it is. Um, so I guess in some ways, what I feel like the thing, the thing about Occupy where I think, not sure how much I'm actually disagreeing with you, is that I think that what you're describing is actually community not getting in the way. Um, but people saying, the, saying we in explicit recognition of deep division and argument because of having the actual continuous personal relationship and doing things together that actually constitutes what look like these natural communities when alienated white kids from the suburbs look at African American neighborhoods in central Brooklyn um, and assume that there is community because it's African American folks living in a neighborhood rather than it's community because people are living on the same block having continuous interactions in ways that then often the other native white kids don't participate in and thus don't feel they have community relationships. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that what you're describing is the best version of what could happen in Occupy, that people come to recognize that, you know, commu community isn't a natural category, that it's defined not by um, agreement and homogeneity, but by dissensus because of the unresolved character of its aggregation, right? That not everybody has the common, has the common interests or whatever. Um, I, th I think the problem, though, is that like that, that can be like an objective sociological account of like what this category refers to. But, but there are two problems. One is that uh, community gets used as a term to constitute mm. forms of agreement through mm -hmm. hegemony, through coercion, on the one hand. And this is something that capitalism has been very good at doing, uh, both in terms of state management and also in terms of uh, organizing consumption. Mm -hmm. the, the other problem is that the, I don't think that the, the, the kind of affect of longing for community, like for this, this moment when we'll all be together, or this idea that some people are already all together and I just want to join them, um, can, be, can be just like recognized and then dispensed with, right? Like I, I think people continue to, I think people continue to, um, to presume that or presume that that's possible within, within a space like this. And then, um, and then when it doesn't happen, rather than dispensing with the category, rather than dispensing with the idea of community, they say, you know, how do we get this to live up to that? And maybe, maybe that shouldn't be the political objective. But I think what's interesting about Occupy is that that was a need that many people found met there, not because there was lack of contention or any noticeable consensus of any kind, um, which makes me say when we're, makes me think about like, what is it that we want to do with these ideas of community that we have floating around and what in them is useful? And pointing to that of like, how much community did you just have while you were having arguments with everybody at every turn, as opposed to how much lack of feeling of community do you have when you get together with people you're supposed to agree with? <laughs> yeah, no, that could be useful. But I, but I think the, the challenge with Occupy, of course, is that in the context where like, your political conception, when pushed to its logical conclusion, is basically civil war, uh -huh. then like, the, the idea is that you're always, that fight, it becomes meaningful, and like, you, you, you slog through it because, you're, like, because the cops are right there underneath, mm -hmm. right? So I, I think that, I think that, that could, you know, that becomes an instance where like, the, the ties of community become a hegemonic force mm -hmm. in a good way. Right? Mm -hmm. But I don't think that resolves the question. Uh -oh. uh, so, I, why don't we save like, one more question? Because we have to close up this thing. So. Sure. I'm, I'll be around a little bit afterward, too. So if people want to chat informally. Um, Yeah. And, um, it's a very practical question and maybe it goes beyond the scope of our conversation, but um, 
I'm very appreciative of listening to you, and um, I said this in a meeting earlier, I feel like I have a lot of uh, meeting to do. Um, the conversation in here has been very nuanced and very uh, complex, I feel like. Um, and I think of my role as a college educator and in Baltimore, where I have many of these young white suburban students coming to Baltimore, and they're very motivated when they come here to connect with what they see beyond their campus. And we have a program at our university, which is a community arts program. And the people that teach within that are very sensitive and aware of all of the complicated issues that revolve around even that terminology. Um, so I find myself, and I'm curious for your uh, insight into this, how to honor that person's desire to um, do something that they, at that point in their development, see as meaningful, that I know will probably transform them um, with, you know, if, if, they, if, if their journey is supported. Um, but at the same time, <coughs> trying to figure out what information or what words or what books um, might be useful so that that point of contact doesn't perpetuate damage that has occurred in the past in the community. And I've never, you know, I, th I just, as an educator, I'm very aware of like that, I'm very interested in the zone of proximal development, where is someone at, where can you take them? And I know that you can't throw a bunch of theory or books at people when they're just like, I really want to do this thing that I think is really good. And mm -hmm. I, as an educator, know that there are some, there's some problems that in that, motivation, but I also want to honor that <coughs> feeling that someone has. And I guess I'm just curious, like, what, you know, what, what words of insight do you have? Maybe it's cynical, but I don't, I don't actually think that there's anything that white kids can do that will make what has already happened any worse than it already is. Oh. So, like, I don't, <laughs> so, so, like, I, I don't think that the question of harm should be the primary consideration in devising a pedagogy. Uh, all I would say is um, that you know, people, people should be fully encouraged to uh, learn and struggle in whatever way they want. Um, and that your, your objective as an educator might simply be to, be to pose the question, like, what is motivating you to do this, right? And stop, stop allowing answers that are about helping other people, right? And start saying, like, no, no, like, intrinsic to your own life, like, why do you want to help? and just use it as the basis for an eminent critique of white experience and get people uh, who want to do this kind of stuff to think about it in terms of like a symptomatic expression of the contradictions of their own white subjectivity and then use that for the basis for a kind of radical anti-racist politics that's not about helping but about abolishing uh, like the, the logic of, of uh, you know, the logic of whiteness itself. That's what I would say. Okay. Uh, Thank you so much.